Okay, in this video, we'll take a look at how to find the extreme values of a function on a closed interval from A to B. Now, before we get into the step-by-step -step process of how to do this, it'll help if, we, first of all, let's do a graphical example that will give you some of the terms and the definitions that we're going to use in this. So to begin with, let's do this. Let's set the interval up. You've got a function f of x, and it's in a closed interval from A to B. So I'm just going to come over here and put... Uh, a point A. We'll assume that A starts right here and we'll put B over here. So you've got an interval from A to B. Now I'll put a vertical line here just to indicate this will be the end point to the interval over here and we'll put a vertical line right here. There's the end point of that interval. Okay, now what we'll do is just make some rough sketches in here and what you want to find are the extreme values. Now, first of all, what are the extreme values? Well, they're where the function hits either a maximum or a minimum value, the absolute maximum or the absolute minimum within the interval. Now, to start with, let's just pick an example here. And what I'm going to do is just draw a graph and we'll look at some definitions as we go across. So suppose the function started right here. Now, it's a closed interval, so it'll include that endpoint. Now, the first possibility is something like this. Suppose the graph went up hit a peak value here, and then started back down again. Now, in that case, this point right here, um, at the top of this thing, the point right there, would be called a local maximum. So that's going to be a local maximum. So if the function is increasing, and then it switches to decreasing, the point where it hits a peak is a local maximum. Now we'll continue that on. Suppose that the function continued down like this and it got down to here and then it did this. It curved back up again. Now at this point the function went from decreasing back to increasing and the point where it hits its absolute bottom right there is called a local minimum. So you could have a local maximum or a local minimum. So what a local maximum is, it's the highest point in the vicinity of the peak Local minimum is the lowest point in the vicinity hits. Now, as we work through this, the question was, how does the first derivative tie into all this? And let's take a look at that. Now, what will happen is this. Wherever you have a maximum value, um, we'll draw a tangent line to that point. And if I draw a tangent line to that point, it'll look like this. Now, the derivative gives you the slope of the tangent line, and at a maximum, you'll have a horizontal tangent, which means this. The first derivative will be equal to zero. So, where the first derivative is equal to zero, uh, horizontal tangent. And you'll have exactly the same thing down here under local minimums. On this point, first derivative would be equal to zero. So, if you have a local maximum or a local minimum, you can identify it because at that point, the first you have to have a horizontal tangent, and therefore the first derivative was equal to zero. Now these points have a special name. I think we'll go ahead and write them up here. They're called critical points. So we'll define what a critical point is. So they're called critical points. So what a critical point is, it consists of two parts. If you have a critical point, that can only occur where the first derivative is equal to zero, or a second possibility that we'll look at here in a second, um, is where the first derivative is undefined. So at a critical point, either the first derivative is equal to zero or it's undefined. Now just because uh, you have a critical point doesn't necessarily guarantee that you have a local maximum or minimum. So let's take a look at that possibility. Let's continue our graph. It's possible the graph might do something like this. It could come up and it could level off just for a second here. So let's go ahead and put a horizontal tangent. At that point right there, I would have a horizontal tangent right there at that point. But there's nothing that says that the graph has to continue back down. It might do this right here. It might continue on and actually go back up again. So, just for a second, I had a horizontal tangent. The graph leveled off right in here, and then uh, started back up again. So, again, what I've got right here is f prime is equal to zero. So, that is a critical point. Uh, so, what I've got here is, I'll put a little CP here. This would be a critical point. This would be a critical point. 
this would be a critical point. And you can draw the following conclusions. Uh, if you have a local maximum or a local minimum, it must occur at a critical point. But just because you have a critical point doesn't guarantee that you have a maximum or a minimum. So what happens is it leveled off here for just a second, but that's not a maximum or a minimum. Now let's continue on around. Suppose we did this. Suppose it went way up here. Let me go back to blue again. Uh, suppose this graph went way up like this. And here is another local maximum. So again, I have a horizontal tangent right there. So that means that f prime is equal to zero, horizontal tangent. Therefore, this thing is a critical point, and it is a local maximum. Now, so far, everything that we've looked at involves where the first derivative is equal to zero. Let's take a look at a point where first derivative is undefined. And you might remember, if you sketch derivative graphs, uh, if, you, if the original function does this, if the original function comes down to a sharp point and maybe does something like this, and we'll extend it out kind of over here. Suppose we did this right here. Uh, wherever the original function has a sharp point, then the derivative is undefined at that point. So that is also a candidate. That could possibly be a critical point, and you have a candidate for a maximum or a minimum right there. So the thing to remember is uh, when you find your critical points, they occur where either the first derivative is equal to zero, as in these examples, or where the, the original function is undefined. So uh, wherever you have the first derivative equal to zero on a horizontal tangent, you have a candidate for a local maximum, local minimum, or perhaps neither. It could be neither. I think we'll go ahead and write that one in here. So this, this could be neither. Now what the extreme values are, the, that's the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum. So if the situation looked like this, then here is a maximum and here is a maximum, but this is the biggest maximum in the interval. So this, this point right here would be the absolute maximum in the interval. It's the biggest value value in the interval. And if we left this situation right here, here is a local minimum, and this one right here would be a local minimum. So you have a local min right there. You have two local minimums, but the absolute minimum would be this one. This is the lowest value of the function in the entire interval. This is the highest value of the function in the entire interval. So those, this would be your absolute maximum. This one right here would be your absolute minimum. Now this would change a little bit. Uh, there's one other possibility you need to consider, and that's the endpoints to the interval. So since it's a closed interval, in this case, uh, the maximum and minimum occurred inside the interval at a critical point. But you have to consider the possibility that it might also occur uh, at the endpoints to the interval. So let's go back and we'll change this just a little bit. Let's take this one and rather than having it go like this, let's erase this and let's pretend that the graph did this. Suppose that the graph went down like this and way down and wound up crossing right here. Now at that point, this is called an end point to the interval. So this is going to be an end point. Now in this case, this is also the minimum value. If you look at this, the smallest value of the function in the entire interval occurs right here. So in this case, this would be the absolute maximum, and this would be the absolute minimum. It might occur at an end point. And the other possibility is perhaps this one over here. Let's go ahead and change this. Suppose that this one did this. Rather than doing this, Suppose it went up steeply, something like this. So it continued up and it wound up way up here. So this would also be an end point. Now, once you've got the critical points and the end points, again, just look at the graph, and the biggest value in the graph is the maximum. So in that case, this thing right here would be the absolute maximum on this entire interval, and this end point would be the absolute minimum. So it just depends on where the values are. So to find the extreme values on a function, the idea is to find the critical points, and possibly the maximum or minimum might occur within the interval at a critical point, 
Or the other possibility is that the extreme values might occur at one of these two endpoints. just depends on what the values are. So, with that in mind, let's uh, take a look at a specific example and see how to work this and see where the first derivative comes in. Okay, now the rules we'll follow look something like this. Given an original function f of x, you've got a closed interval from a to b. Now the steps look like this. <clears throat> uh, the very first thing you're going to do is to find the first derivative. Now why do you need to do that? Well, if you're trying to identify the maximums and minimums, they're going to occur, if they occur, they're going to occur at critical points inside the interval. Uh, so we'll find the first derivative. Now, to find the critical points, they occur where you have a horizontal tangent, and that's where the first derivative is equal to zero. So the idea is find the first derivative, set it equal to zero, and that will tell you where you have horizontal tangents, and that will give you the values of x where the critical points occur. Now at this point, you won't know if they're maximums or minimums, or neither, but at least you'll know you have a horizontal tangent there. Now the other possibility, and we won't look at it in this video, but we'll look at it in another video, is that find values of x where the original, uh, where the derivative is undefined, which might be a sharp point. And we'll take a look at that in another video. Okay, now once you've got the critical points, then the next thing to do is to evaluate the original function at the critical points to see if those are maximums or minimums, and then also consider the possibility that the maximum or minimum might occur at an endpoint. So you have to evaluate it at both inside the interval at the critical points and at the edges of the interval at the endpoints. And then finally, if you just put all these numbers in a list, the largest value in that list will be the maximum, the smallest value will be the minimum. So with that in mind, let's try an example, and you'll see it's actually not very hard to do. We'll take a look at it and see what it looks like. <coughs> okay, here's our first example. Uh, suppose we had this. Here's a function f of x is equal to 4x cubed minus 3x to the fourth, and we want to find it on this interval right here. Now, in this interval, um, this is going to be a, and this is going to be b. So I want to go from minus 1 to 2. Now, we'll follow the steps, and let's kind of look at the steps again. Um, the first step says find the first derivative. So the first thing we're going to do is to find the first derivative. Uh, so we'll go back up here and uh, find the first derivative. So step number one is to find, find uh, f prime of x. Well, the first derivative would look like this. f prime of x is going to be equal to, and just take the derivative of this using the power rule. That'll turn into 12x squared minus 12x cubed. So you've got the first derivative. <clears throat> now, that's step number one. So let's take a look at step number two. Step number two says, now set the first derivative equals zero and solve for x, which will give you the location of the critical points. So let's try that. Okay, so in step number two, uh, you'll take the first derivative. So 12x squared minus 12x cubed and set it equal to zero and solve for x. Now to solve this, what I would do, both these have a 12 and both of them have at least an x squared, so I'd factor that out. So this gives you 12x squared, and when you factor it out, you'd have 1 minus x right here is equal to 0. So all you did there is factor a 12x squared out of both those two terms. Now, uh, to solve this, go ahead and set each factor equal to 0. So I'll set that equal to 0, and I'll set that equal to 0. Well, when you set x squared equal to 0, you get x is equal to 0, and this is a critical. There's your first critical point. Then set this factor equal to 0. 1 minus x is equal to 0, which gives you 1 is equal to x, and there is a second critical point. So you've got a, two critical points out of this. Now, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and sketch a line. I would suggest that whenever you work these problems, draw yourself a number line, and you can make a rough sketch of what this looks like, and it'll help you visualize what's going on. So what we'll do is go from here, and I think I'll put it right here, um, starting at here, and I want to go over to here. So I'll just draw a rough number line that looks like this. Again, just kind of set it up, um, and I'll put the endpoints of the interval on here. So what I've got is 
um, starting right here, I've got a, which is a negative 1, and I'm going to go over to here, um, b, which is a 2. Now, inside here, this would be uh, 0 is right here. Um, I've got 1, say, right here, and so on. So just a rough graph of what this thing looks like. Now, what you've got is this. is You know when x is equal to 0, you're going to have a horizontal tangent right here, but you're not sure exactly where it's located. You also know you're going to have a horizontal tangent right here. So those are candidates for maximums or minimums. So now with that in mind, uh, we'll take a look at the next step in the, in the process. Okay, so we go on to step number three. And by the way, let's go back and do one more thing here first. One thing about it. it says find values where the function is undefined. Well, this is a polynomial, and polynomials are defined everywhere. So in this case, uh, this function will never be undefined. So <clears throat> um, part B here, we don't have to worry about here. So we go to step three. And what step three says is <clears throat> evaluate the original function at the critical points and the endpoints to find candidates for maximums or minimums. Now, when you do this, I would suggest you do the following. We'll go ahead and drop this down a little bit. Um, on step number three, so we'll go to step three. And what I'm going to do is to evaluate the function, and, and I would suggest you put them in order from left to right. So what we've got is a critical point right here. We've got a critical point right here. We've got an end point right here, and we've got an end point right here. And I would suggest go from left to right. So you want to evaluate the original function at the left endpoint, and I'm just going to go from left to right as I go across here. Then you want to evaluate the original function at the first critical point. Then you want to evaluate the original function at the second critical point. And you want to evaluate the original function at the right endpoint, which is 2. So again, when you set this up, um, the first one, this is an endpoint, this is a critical point, this is a critical point, and this is an endpoint. And what you'll do is get a list of four values, and you'll know which one is the maximum, which one's the minimum. So with that in mind, let's try this. All you do is this. This just says take a negative 1 and plug it into the original function. So the original function is 4x cubed minus 3x to the 4th. So we'll plug this in. We'll have 4 and go ahead and plug in a negative 1 cubed minus 3 times a negative 1 to the 4th power. And what that's going to give you would be 4. Uh, negative 1 cubed would be a negative 1. That's going to give you a negative 4. And then when you take negative 1 to the 4th power, that'll turn into a positive 1, which gives you a negative 3. And that gives you a negative 7. Now, you don't have to do this, but what I'm going to do is just make a rough sketch up here. I'm going to go and say when x is a negative 1, I get a value of a negative 7, which say is about, I'm just going to make up a point about right there. So there's the first point, candidate. Now I'll plug a 0 into this thing. So this would be 4 times 0 cubed minus 3 times 0 to the 4th power. Now, both those would be zero, so you'll get 0 minus 0, which would be 0. And that means when x is equal to 0, y is equal to 0, you've got a point right there. And you might remember, at this point, you also know you have a horizontal tangent. So I'm going to go ahead and real quickly sketch a horizontal tangent line right there, because that's a critical point. I know it's a horizontal tangent. Now the next one. Um, now take a 1 and plug it in this thing. So 4 times 1 cubed minus 3 times 1 to the fourth power. And that gives you a 4 minus 3, which would be a 1. So I've got a 1 right here. So when x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1, and I have a point about right there. Now remember, that's a critical point, so I know I'm going to have a horizontal tangent right there. So I'll go ahead and sketch that horizontal tangent. And then finally, the last one, um, I've got, I want to plug a 2 into this thing. 
So I'll move it up just a little bit, and let's go 4 times 2 cubed minus 3 times 2 to the 4th power. And 2 cubed is 8 times 4 would be 32 minus, and then this would be 2 to the 4th would be 16 times 3 would be 48, which gives you a negative 16. Now at this point, I'm just going to put a little box around this set of numbers right here. So what I've got is these numbers here are my candidates for the maximums and the minimums. And at this point, I'll go ahead and plot this one. So when x is equal to 2, y is equal to a negative 16, which is down somewhere about right here. Now let's go back and take a look at the rules. This finishes step 3. So uh, if we go back to the rules, um, we've now evaluated them. We've got the candidates for a maximum or minimum. So in step four, all you do is this. Just look at your list. The largest value in the list is the maximum. The smallest value in the list is the minimum. So with that in mind, we do the following. Uh, I'll put this back to red again, and we'll do this. The smallest value in the list is that right there. So the minimum is and this is going to be the absolute minimum, we'll call it the ABS, the absolute minimum is negative 16, and that occurs at x is equal to 2. So there is the absolute minimum, the extreme value uh, for this function in the interval. Now what the maximum is, it's the biggest number in the list. So the biggest number in the list is that number right there, so the absolute maximum is 1, y is equal to 1, and that occurs at x is equal to 1. So there is the answer to the problem. Now again, you don't have to do this, but I always think it helps to sketch the graph, so let's quick, make a quick sketch of what this thing would have to look like. Now what happens is the graph starts here, and it has to level off and have a horizontal tangent here. So the graph has to look something like this. It'll come up like this. It hits right here and levels off. So there's a critical point. And then it begins to increase again. It's a horizontal tangent right here and then starts down. So what happens is here is a maximum. Uh, the graph continues on down like this until it gets to a negative 16 right here. This was a negative 7. And so this point right here is the absolute maximum on the interval. This point right here is the absolute minimum on the interval. So that's going to be the absolute minimum. So again, if you just stay with the four steps, um, let's go back and take one more quick look at those. Um, the steps just say, uh, find, first of all, you want to find the first derivative. And the reason you need the first derivative is so you can get the critical points. So once you've got the first derivative, the critical points occur where you have a horizontal tangent and that occurs where the first derivative is equal to zero. So set the first derivative equal to zero, solve for x, that will give you candidates for maximum or minimum. Then evaluate the original function at the critical points and the endpoints and build yourself up a list of numbers. Then look at that list of numbers. The biggest number in the list is the maximum, the smallest one is the minimum. So again, uh, Evaluated at the two endpoints and at any critical points, get a list of numbers. The biggest number in the list is the maximum, the smallest number in the list is the minimum. So that's an example of extreme values. Now this one did not have a point where the where the derivative was undefined. In the next video, we'll look at exactly the same kind of problem, but uh, the first derivative will be undefined and you have to approach it a little bit differently.